Are you ready? The Cornelia Stephanie Show. Wake up to love your call to action. Join Cornelia as she empowers others to live heaven on earth. Cornelia teaches listeners how to be the authority over yourself, embracing your inner guru. Feel yourself uplifted into limitless expansion, integrating ease and grace in a changing world. This show will cover topics such as unconditional love, your physical body, how to be in extraordinary relationships, create financial and emotional wealth, embracing entrepreneurship in the new earth. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Cornelia Stephanie Show, Living Heaven on Earth. I'm so excited about this t- show topic that we have today and my very special guest that's here because we're talking about a really um, touchy subject on uh, how to use cancer to evolve into love. My very special guest, Reverend David Maggingly, he is a Lutheran minister and he has such a powerful message to share. David is a four-time cancer survivor, and he has had a profound near-death experience. David was on the other side when his guide told him that it's not time yet, that he has to go back, that he has to return back to earth. And David didn't want to. He didn't want to return. But his guide told him that he has to come back because he still had so much work to do. Uh, David told me that he felt like his guide was his best friend. That was the feeling that he got. And his guide told him, it's going to be all right. Can you imagine having that kind of an experience and coming back to earth? My special guest David Maggingly is an interfaith minister at Queen Elizabeth Health Sciences Center in Halifax, Nova Scotia. He's also an award-winning author of Beyond Surviving Cancer and Your Spiritual Journey. David has also survived cancer four times himself, and that's why he has had that near-death, that profound near-death experience which led him into explorations of the nature of consciousness and the connection of body, mind, and spirit. So we're here today to talk about how to use cancer to evolve into love with my very special guest, David Maggingly. Welcome to the show, David. Thank you, Cornelia. So great to be here. It's an honor to have you here. So this is quite, this must have been quite a journey for you. And when you and I had our conversation, our pre-interview to talk about um, bringing you on, you were telling me about what took place that faded time when you had that near-death experience. I think that's where I want to start today because I want to, I want to um, shine the light on what happened when you were literally on the other side and you met your guide. So tell us about what that experience was like. What was that experience like for you when you found yourself? Were you like in the light or were you, how did you know? Um, Tell us about the feeling, tell us about the experience. Well, um, it's ineffable. It's quite difficult to find the words that accurately convey the transcendent joy and sense of oneness and being finally whole. Uh, But let me set it up for you a bit. Sure. It it happened while I was on internship. I was training to be a a minister, and we spent one year in a parish. And part of my assignment was to go to the local hospital and do a church service in the chapel. So I uh, was just into the service, just beginning my sermon. I began to feel flush and very hot and woozy. And in only about 10 seconds, I collapsed. Now, I'm a very tall minister. <laughs> I'm six feet, eight inches tall. Wow. So when I collapse, it's a, it's a long way down, and I have a lot to think about on the way. Uh, and it terrified, of course, all the people in the, in the service. Fortunately, there were 
there was a doctor, there were a few nurses there as well. And they rushed up to me as soon as I had collapsed and found that my heart had stopped. But I didn't care because I found myself suddenly on this grassy hill hmm. in, in a place of such simplicity and yet profound beauty that I, um, I was elated, I was overjoyed. I, unlike many people who have a near-death experience, didn't have the rush through the tunnel into the uh, point mm -hmm. of light. Mm -hmm. I found myself, as, as many do, um, suddenly there. I could feel every blade of grass. I could uh, sense every movement. I was one with everything. And this was a, a grassy hill with a dramatic sky. And at the top of the hill was a tree. With all the fiber of my being, I wanted to run to the top of that hill and get to that tree because I knew if I got to the other side, I would never come back here. I was filled with elation and literally jumping up and down saying, I'm home, I'm home, I'm home. And um, it, was, <laughs> it, it was beautiful. And then my guide was there. Now, it was as if I dropped into the middle of our conversation. He was there immediately and I felt that kinship, that belonging with him. And he was, as you mentioned, uh, my best friend. He'd known me all my life. It was a distinctly masculine, angelic entity. Mm -hmm. And he said, it's great to see you, David. <laughs> it was surprisingly casual how he said that. And I said, I'm home, I'm home, come on, let's go to the top of the hill, got to get to that tree. And uh, I felt this. Huh. People have asked me to describe him. And mm -hmm. I can't in physical terms, but uh, if you can see uh, beauty, power, compassion, majesty, wonder, depth, wisdom, authority, compassion, friendship, love, that's what he looked like. And he said, now you can't go up there, uh, but things are going very well. Things are going very well for you. And um, you actually have to go back. You can't stay here. And I, I thought that was ridiculous. I said, go back, why, why on earth would I go back? I'm finally home, come on, let's go. But there was something in the power of his presence that prevented my feet from even moving. We walked uh, smoothly and gently through this grass. And he explained, uh, while things are going very well, you have a lot more work to do and you can't stay here. So you have to go back, but we will be with you. Notice the, the plural, we ah. will be with you. And I, uh, I argued, <laughs> I, I did not want to come back here. And um, I knew I was losing the argument. My heart began to sink as I realized I was going back. And I, I just said, no, you, you can't do that. Please don't do that. Oh. Please don't. I felt the touch of his hand upon my shoulder, uh, such as I had a shoulder. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I, was, I was dead, but... I had a body like this one. I was, I was me. I had legs and arms and I was walking. And I, and, but that place was more real than this one. Mm -hmm. And I felt more alive than I ever have here. And I felt finally whole and complete. You know, here we're restraining against different aspects of ourselves. Very rarely are we fully present in the moment. But there, the moment is all that there is and you are home. So he, uh, he touched my shoulder and I felt this endearing, compassionate laughter rise from within him. And it was uh, in, like you would have for a little boy who doesn't want to go to bed. And he just said, it'll be okay. We'll see you later. And boom, I was back. And boom, you were back. And boom, you made the choice to come back. Reluctantly. Uh, it turns out in near-death experiences, some people are sent back, like me. Uh, some people decide to come back because of the unfinished love story of their lives. And others just find themselves back here, just like that. I'm curious, though, though uh, what that does with free will. Yeah, I think it's quite complicated. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, sometimes think, you think we're pushed? 
yes, sometimes we're pushed back. Sometimes we don't have a choice. Okay. Uh, we have free will, but we only have choice within a certain set of um, possibilities. And beyond that, we don't have a choice. And yet within that set, there are more, you know, there's more than enough choices to make. Right. Um, but uh, it's complicated. It raises that question, do we all have an assignment here on earth? Yeah. Does that have particular details? Yeah. That's a complicated question. And while I, I don't believe in a predetermined plan, uh, that doesn't mean I don't believe in there's a fundamental purpose for us. So we'll find out on the other side. We don't need to figure it all out on this side. Okay. And it's all, it's all about the exploration and discovery, isn't it? And uh, yeah. bringing in the new uh, evolved consciousness of what it is that we're, we're really capable of, isn't it? Yes, I think that's the fundamental homework, to evolve into love itself. And that has a variety of paths for everyone, but the end result is the same. So your spiritual homework that uh, is waiting for you is always, how do you love? If you, you, love? you focus on your love, you're going to be focusing on the deepest spiritual and the most noble quality of life. Mm -hmm. That wisdom will guide you. Yeah, and that's what we're all doing here, isn't it? How do we evolve into love? How, how do we love? And isn't that what most people um, ask themselves at the end of their life is, was I loved? Did I give love? Did I receive love? Was I, was I being loved, right? And we all do it awkwardly, um, sporadically, even you know, coming back from my near-death experience, which was in 1988. It did not result in me being an evolved soul. It did not upgrade my consciousness. If anything, it threw me into a bit of a wilderness because I have never since that day felt at home in this world. Mm -hmm. I have you been have, I was gonna ask you that. I was gonna ask you, because when you were talking about, you know, um, feeling um, the oneness and feeling the blade of grass, and when you were talking about the, the joy that you were feeling, have you ever had that feeling here on earth since you've been back like that? I have grazed the edge of it. And those have been beautiful moments, but nothing has matched it. Nothing has been so total and complete. And it has uh, renewed my faith and uh, mm. my understanding, but it has revolutionized it. The ancient terms of the church have a, have a new definition for me, and I, I perceive them in a different way. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah um so i i'm curious about a lot of things i want to i want to find out about um were you um well first of all i want to talk a little bit about your guide your your friend do you do you still communicate with him by any chance are you having a dialogue with him or do you just get a sense that he's with you all the time I trust completely that not only is he with me, but many more, because he said, we are with you. Mm -hmm. Nobody is alone in this, and you do not have just one agent on the other side. Mm -hmm. There is a multitude of celestial entities which accompany us every moment of our life. That's, that's so good to know, isn't it, uh, that, that we're not alone. It's like a validation mm -hmm. of... Um, that we're not alone, we're, we're kind of um, doing this, we're doing this work together. It's a partnership. It's a partnership, it's a relationship. Yeah, and um, it's important that each one of us claim the indispensable role that we have in that partnership, not to downplay it or abdicate our power mm -hmm. in, in uh, shifting that flow of love, which not only ripples through our hearts and changes us, but through us changes the world. So your question, do I talk with them? Yes, all the time. It continues to be a very casual conversation. Often it's the, um, it's the request. I start with, you know, how are you guys doing today? And uh, let's, let's go do something beautiful. Mm -hmm. Or I, I may, if I'm in a heavy situation, as my work often brings me to, I'll say, you know, guide me, you know, be with me in this. Yeah. And sometimes, let's be honest, sometimes, I uh, ask them just to, to go away because I may be embarrassed about my own thoughts or feelings. 
Yeah. And I don't want to be transparent to them. Mm. But because I'm as human as the next person. But they receive all of our nuisance and foibles with absolute compassion and a good dose of humor. So we should too. Absolute compassion and forgiveness. Basically, in that in that um, level of consciousness, all is already forgiven anyway, because right. they they know that you're human and that you have your human thoughts and you're here to transcend those negative thoughts and send those thoughts back to the light. Is that right? Yes, because anything that is not of love mm -hmm. is not eternal and therefore not actually real. It's mm -hmm. part of the the dream and the uh, the fabric of this reality, but not the ultimate reality from which ours emerges. Mm -hmm. So only love is ultimately real, so only love will continue. And this is really pretty much what our message is today when you and I decided to have this interview, is really the, um, the message is to evolve love, to, to spread love, and to have this interview go viral on the internet, sending out the waves of love, supporting other people that are possibly experiencing um, whether they're experiencing some kind of um, health crisis or some kind of spiritual crisis or relationship crisis, but always to go back in and consult the own inner bank of love. Yes, and um, to, to do more than, you know, to love, to do even more than that, to be love. To be love. So, because love, I, I believe, love is not an emotion. Love is an entire state of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And it is absolute completion, wholeness, congruency, connection. It is infused with the intelligence of the universe. And it is something I experienced briefly in 15 minutes of terrestrial time, though there it felt much longer. I was one with love. One with love. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, so David, in 1988 is when you had your um, near-death experience. And you just, it was a year, you were just becoming an interfaith, a minister. Um, yes, during in the Lutheran church, yes. Yeah, and what, what made you want to become a minister? I'm curious about that. Like, what, what started that? Well, cancer started that. I was really? 17. Yeah, I was 17 okay. when uh, I developed a tumor in my bladder. And um, it was removed successfully. And I was told at the time it was benign. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but it made me re-examine my life. I had been a very shy and careful young man. And I had a lot of questions about, well, what, what is the meaning of life from that? So mm -hmm. I studied philosophy and comparative religions in university. And I just learned to ask better and better questions. So I went to seminary. I was a member of a church, though I actually identified myself as more spiritual than religious at the time. Mm -hmm. And I found that I loved seminary. I didn't intend on being ordained. I just wanted to ask better questions and dig deep. However, internship comes up in your third year and you've got to go. So I did and discovered that I loved ministry. I loved loving people and exploring with them the questions, never really finding an answer, just trusting the answer had found us and moving in that love. And is that, uh, is that what you love about ministry is um, loving, loving love, being, being a minister of light, being a minister of love? Being an ambassador of love, um, but not in a way that places me above people, but brings me alongside of them and enables me to have a deep presence, uh, especially now as I'm a hospital chaplain. I work in cancer care intensive care and palliative care. And my job is to incarnate love and help others tap into the wisdom within them to navigate this storm and do something they never imagined that they could do. Not only to face cancer and survive it, not only to go through cancer, but to grow through cancer in the full dimension of their being. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so so um, you were you went to ministry school and and then you became an ordained minister. You survived cancer that first time. And then tell us about the second time. The second time I was um, in my parish. Uh, at, no, I, I was on that internship. The second tumor is what made me collapse. 
what we discovered was it wasn't benign. It had grown back and it was a nasty tumor called uh, pheochromocytoma. Now these, imagine you have a time bomb sitting in your body and the trigger that makes it blow is your own adrenaline. So as soon as you feel anything intense, uh, fear, anxiety, passion and joy, um, dread, anger, it causes the tumor to blow. Most people die within 10 seconds. I am very lucky to be here. I have collapsed countless times. Only the one time did I glimpse the other side. It is a horrible feeling uh, when you recover from, from these episodes. So I was in seminary and uh, the second tumor was removed in my final year uh, and it was on my femoral artery. So we knew it was seeding the rest of my body. And uh, the surgery is very dangerous because a bomb squad is basically going in to remove the tumor. As soon as they touch it and manipulate it, it explodes again. So they have to watch your blood pressure, which can skyrocket so high, it blows your blood vessels. I had a great surgical team uh, that second time. And I recovered just in time to graduate from seminary and go to my first parish in a little country town of 600 people on the prairie. And on that first day, I found myself sitting at the side of a bedside of a man who was dying. And I felt oddly at home. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's incredible. What an incredible story. Yeah. It, it seems like you are here. That's, that's part of the mission is really being able to um, transcend, not death, if you will, but transcend um, the, way that we, the way that we look at death and the way that we perceive death and the way that we experience it um, because you're so at home with it. You, it's almost kind of like you got intimate with death. More yeah, with mortality. And as long as your love is stronger than your fear, mm -hmm. you can navigate that, that storm. Mm -hmm. So now, and, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just thinking, in fact, a love and compassion enable mm -hmm. you to use the energy of distress and anxiety and uh, use that to move even faster uh, towards your destination of love. We can explore that in a little bit. It's a, it's a complicated thing. Yeah. Um, so that was the second time. Third time. Third time I was uh, here uh, in Nova Scotia. I uh, had moved to a parish here in the suburbs of Halifax. And uh, the tumor was acting up again. And I was having episodes of collapsing. And we found it was on uh, my, um, in the muscle and around the ureter near the kidney on the right side. And... Um, I, I got through that one by the skin of my teeth. Uh, the surgery went fairly smoothly, but recovery in intensive care did not. Uh, at one point, um, I'm lying there, and it was um, late, late at night, and I heard code blue being called, and I know what that means. And I thought, my goodness, who's the poor, poor fellow who's uh, on the edge of life? And then they came crashing through my door, and it was me. Oh. And <laughs> they... <laughs> They, they looked at me and they, they said, you know, can you hear us? Can you hear us? And I looked up and I said, of course I can hear you. How are you guys doing? And they looked at me with absolute confusion because my blood pressure was bottoming out. I should not have been conscious. Now, a little backstory on that one. I had, about a month earlier, been at a retreat, a spiritual retreat with a, a therapeutic touch teacher. So this is energy healing. And I had been practicing energy healing for some years. It was one of the abilities I found after um, I had returned from my near-death experience. And the teacher had given me a private treatment. As she scanned through my energy field, she paused. She didn't know I had cancer. And she said over, over that area, what's this? Mm. And I said, it's a tumor. And she began to treat the tumor. And then she stopped and she began to weep. And I asked, what's going on? And she whispered, there's an angel of the most high across the bed from us. Oh. And I, I looked around. I was so excited. But all I saw was the wall. I mm -hmm. couldn't even sense the angel. Mm -hmm. And then she, she stopped weeping after a while. I just held the space and listened. 
And I asked, well, where is she? And, and she said, the angel's gone now. So what's the message I asked? And, and she said, <laughs> she said, it's going to be very rough this time, but we'll be with you and give you strength. That's not too comforting, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, I held that in my heart and contemplated it, but I didn't tell it to anyone. And then there I was in the intensive care unit. They crashed in. They're, they're putting a central line, it's called the swan's gans, cutting into my throat, threading it down into my heart, putting epidural into my spine, putting drugs into me that they've never given to a conscious person. And I looked up at the doc and I said, uh, you look stressed. <laughs> uh, let, let me sing you a song. And I began to sing, uh, hum a hymn that I, I'm familiar with. And he looked at me um, like, well, I was on drugs and I was at the time, but uh, I should have been unconscious. I should have been dead. Wow. It went, yeah. Wow. That's, that's absolutely incredible. Uh, how many times that you've actually had to face this and how many times your team, your angelic team and your soul team and your guides have been with you, supporting you through this and giving you messages of stay with it, stay with it, stay with it. Uh, David, I want to talk to you more about this. We're going to take a quick break. You're listening to the Cornelia Stephanie Show. I'm with Reverend David Maggingly, and we'll be right back. Hi, my name is Janet Hickox, and I want to tell you a little story about a story and how my friend Cornelia Stephanie helped me through to the other end of that story. I have gone from the dark of a story I was telling myself that wasn't true to the light of optimism to see my way out of where I was and to where I wanna go. And it all started with uh, her scheduling a session for me to help me reclaim my money or my financial empowerment. Up until that point, I had been telling the story that my business was dying, that my business was not successful anymore. And the more I tried to figure out what was going on, the worse I felt about it. And when I had to get ready to do the session with Cornelia, she asked me to go look at the numbers and where I was uh, through the year to date. And then also to come prepared with a number that I wanted to uh, raise my income to. Well, I was quite comfortable with that part, right? I knew where I wanted to be. Uh, what I wasn't comfortable with doing is going and looking up those numbers. But I made myself do it, even though I tried to backpedal my way out of the session. Um, she didn't know that, but I was going to try to get myself out of the session. And I looked up those numbers. And it was incredible that I discovered through that process that my business wasn't dying. In fact, I was doing 12% better than I had the year before. So I was shocked. I was shocked literally at the power of the story that I had been telling for months. But more than that, I was shocked that I had allowed myself to get there. And uh, later in that day when I had my session with Cornelia, she pointed out some very obvious things like, how are you going to get where you want to go if you don't know where you want to go? How are you going to get there if you don't have the goals written out, if you don't have it uh, set up so that you know where you are and where you're going to go? Totally makes sense, right? If I, and I had been in business, uh, somebody else's business as a sales manager for years, and I, I was a national sales manager. I had awards for sales management. I had business awards because of numbers. And yet when it came to doing my own business, I totally forgot all that I'd ever learned. So by the time Cornelia working with me in just one session, got me to look deeper at the numbers and where did I want to go and actually, you know, claiming where I wanted to go. Um, I was filled with a sense of optimism and hope. Like you can't believe it was like, everything shifted for me. And I am so looking forward to our continued sessions to see how far I can really push myself to get where, I, where I've only dreamed of being, where I've never taken the dream and actually brought it into concrete existence. So thank you, Cornelia, for the work that you're doing out there. I appreciate it. And I can't wait to see where I go from here. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. You're listening to the Cornelia Stephanie Show, and we're talking about 
how to evolve through cancer, grow through cancer with my very special guest, Reverend David Maggingly. And before we went to break, we were talking about David has survived cancer three times. And then I just want to touch on the fourth time. Fourth time. We talked about three times, and now we're going to touch on the fourth time that you actually survived it. Yeah. Uh, that, again, here in Halifax, um, I had um, only a short remission. Um, my first remission from being 17 was 10 years. And then I, I had a, about an eight-year remission, and then it was only two years later. Mm -hmm. um, the tumor had seeded itself and now was growing again in the lymph nodes of my abdomen. Uh, the symptoms, I was very familiar with them by this point. Um, I could mm -hmm. sense the anxiety, uh, what feels like anxiety, your heart racing, the sweatiness, your fingernails turn blue because the mm -hmm. capillaries get um, calcified. Hmm. And um, you you have uh, you have what looks like an anxiety attack, but by this time I had employed meditation hmm. to survive these, so that I could overcome the autonomic nervous system and calm myself down. Mm -hmm. Meditation is among the the things like my surgical team who saved my life, but it doesn't remove the tumor. That has to be done by my team and. Um, we, we scheduled the, the surgery. We had to let the tumor grow. You have to let it grow so it shows up on the scanner. So that means a year of being on the edge of, of life and um, learning to mitigate these, these attacks. The, uh, the tumor behaved itself uh, more during the surgery this time, and it all went fairly smoothly. But I uh, used it to reevaluate um, what, what is my goal? What am I to do with this cancer? How am I to use it to evolve into love? Is there a reason it keeps coming back? You know, I ask that question as many people do. Is there a purpose in this? Do I have it for some reason? And I couldn't find an answer to that, but quickly then moved from why did I get this to what am I going to do with it? Up to this time, even with three cancers, I had focused, uh, really on just living my normal life and loving as best I could. But now I put it into overdrive. Mm -hmm. And um, it was something that compelled me to start writing, um, to start taking meditation even more seriously. And from that, I decided I don't belong in a parish anymore. I really want to work in the hospital and be with the cancer patients. So uh, a while after that, I, I moved out of uh, the hospital, of the the church, and as an interfaith minister, I began taking care of people here in Halifax. And it's been one of the most difficult jobs and profound privileges of my entire life. Mm -hmm. So um, the, did you answer your question of why me? Was that, was that why me? Why did I get cancer? Did you, yeah, did you answer I, that question? I did find an answer that I am at peace with. Okay. And uh, the, the, the main part of the answer is, why me? Why not? <laughs> we live in a culture in which uh, one in three, in many parts of North America, it's one in two people will get cancer if they live into their 80s. And um, it is because we live and swim in a toxic environment that we have created. The environmental, dietary, the uh, the factors within uh, mutations of genetics are so multifaceted, we're never going to pin down the exact reason biologically and environmentally. But mm -hmm. we know that we are being bombarded with um, things that cause cancer. So that's the first practical level that I stay with. Um, and I, I choose to, to emphasize that because we don't want to jump to a spiritual reason as if it's been inflicted upon us for us to grow. Right. Don't believe God does. That God can use any crisis to help us evolve into love, and nothing is going to derail that agenda. Nothing accelerates the journey into love, becoming love, quite like a crisis. Mm -hmm. It makes us align priority, most important, and direct our energy into those we care about and what we care for. 
Did you did you get mad at God? We talked. <laughs> <laughs> we had some discussions. Uh-huh. Uh, there were days I was pissed off, and I would I would say, you know, just leave me alone for a while. And I, really, again, um, but those were days when I was bumping up against the edge of my coping. And when you do that, you grow. <laughs> Those edges get pushed out, and it's going to feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. so, but yeah. you know, the response was always, "I'm with you." Mm -hmm. I never had that explanation dictated into my brain, my brain or my soul, but I did have a presence imparted to me that again made me feel completely safe and connected. And you, you have a knowing now, you have a knowing now through many times of experience, and that's why you're able to help people. Um, being in the hospital uh, where you're helping many people that are faced with um, cancer. And so you have three ways. So what are the three ways? The growing through cancer, what are your three, I, what are they again? Um, the, the, the main things is first, to be fully present with the crisis. The quality of your presence with yourself will determine the quality of your experience in this moment. Mm -hmm. It's gonna determine how you uh, are in relationship with others. Mm -hmm. So that's always the place to start. Cancer taught me to show up. Now, that means if you're afraid, if you're angry, if you're anxious, be that. Don't yeah. hide it. But watch yourself having that experience. Be compassionately present with yourself uh, because those are just parts of the human journey. And those are important. Those are important emotions and states that are telling you something important. Yeah. So the quality of your presence with yourself is the first thing. Mm -hmm. the, second, the second thing cancer taught me is um, have a sense of humor about yourself. Don't take this all so seriously. Uh, we tend to beat ourselves up and be the worst enemy. Um, the critical voice in our head is relentless and it just won't, won't stop. So listen to that, listen to the fear, listen to the, uh, all the noise and watch it. And then say to those parts of you, I hear you, I love you, I'm with you, but I'm driving, you're not. So mm -hmm. sit back and we'll get through. Mm -hmm. And then the, the final biggest thing cancer taught me is we are not alone. We are always connected to the reality of heaven, the reality of love, um, a dimension of consciousness, pure consciousness, from which our, our reality arises and from which I emanate in every moment. So if you can just walk down the street, walk to work, sit with your family, and quietly, secretly affirm within yourself, I am emanating from the love of the universe, and so are all these people. Even if someone is angry with you, or they're upset and crying, you can compassionately hold that aspect of themselves while affirming that uh, they are a beautiful, immortal expression of God. Even if they've forgotten it in themselves, you will not forget. Right. You're offering that presence. And by you being that presence, that's going to give them the opportunity to experience that for themselves. Right. I want to help them remember. You want to help them remember. Yeah. I, I would like you to let everybody know where they can, um, first of all, get in contact with you. I want to get, get your email address. I want to get your website. And I also want to talk about your award-winning book where they can get your award-winning book on Amazon as well. So please give us that information. Okay. So you can find me at davidmcginley.com. Now my last name has an odd spelling, M-A-G-I-N-L-E-Y, davidmcginley.com. You can contact me through there. You can email me. Uh, you can go to my Facebook page, which is D McGinley, and uh, message me through there. And that's where you hear a lot about the events that I'll be uh, offering. I'm going to be speaking next week at the International Association for Near-Death Studies Conference in Bellevue, Washington, just outside of Seattle. And uh, that's going to be on Thursday morning next week. Uh, and I'm very excited about that. I'm, I'm involved with that organization because I hear near-death experiences every month at work. Mm -hmm. Imagine having a job where you get that. Wow. Yeah. So email, 
if you want a direct email, david at davidmcginley.com. And uh, the book is available through any bookstore, or you can buy it online at Amazon. And what's the name of the book? Beyond Surviving Cancer and Your Spiritual Journey. I should have had a copy here. I could hold it up. Yeah. Um, yep. And they can get that on Amazon also. And then we have a free gift for two listeners today that send you the first email that they're writing to you. They're, you're going to send them uh, a copy of your book, right? Uh, through uh, Kindle or whatever. Um, would you let us know about that? Yes. The book is available in print, Kindle, and I'm just releasing the audiobook. So it is my voice narrating uh, my words, and I'm so excited to put that out there. Oh, that's wonderful. So can we get your email address again, please, David? David at David McGinley, M-A-G-I-N-L-E-Y dot com. Wonderful. So we're going to be right back because we want to talk about how long you've been cancer free and what, what life is like for you every single day now. Uh, living over there where you are, living cancer-free today. You're listening to the Cornelia Stephanie Show. We'll be right back. My name's Bob Skeel. I'm 91 years old, and I want to take a few minutes now to share with you the important role, actually the critical role, Cornelia has played in my life. I say critical because I'm not sure I'd be alive at all to the many possibilities that make up our human experience at my age if not for her. I could have easily become another dead man walking, only half conscious, stumbling through my remaining years, if it hadn't been for Cornelia. Six years ago, I lost my wife to Alzheimer's. We'd been married for 61 years. I never thought I'd be a widower, but there I was, suddenly lost and alone, but with the good sense to set a working goal for myself. I was going to spend the rest of my life committed to unconditional love, whatever that meant and wherever that took me. A year or so later, Cornelia came along, helping me over several years to focus that unconditional love where it had never been focused before, on me. My whole life, my entire being had been focused on love of neighbor, and I had derived great satisfaction from that but in the process, I had ignored the second part. I love your neighbor as yourself. Now it was time to direct that love inward. I didn't see that right away, but Cornelia did. And she drew me there. She drew me actually to God. Through many conversations over coffee and after numerous, sometimes tearful, agonizing discussions, Cornelia was able to lead me kicking and screaming to within where I needed to be. It was there finally that I was able to re-identify myself. It was in bringing unconditional love to myself that I now saw myself in a new light, a fully conscious, worthy human being capable of healing, loving, and creating in my own right all these gifts of the evolutionary process. I'm a new man now younger as I get older. I don't move as fast as I once did, of course, but my smile is quicker and I engage the heart and mind of others more readily. I would likely not be at such a wonderful stage in my life if not for Kania. I owe my new life to her, a wonderful friend and a constant source of inspiration. Thank you, Kania. So, David, tell us how long you've been cancer-free. 18 years. This is the longest remission of my life. <laughs> yes, celebrate. It's <laughs> wonderful. So I think that I'm in the clear now. Uh, if there was a reason I had to get cancer, I must be the most thick-headed guy on the planet because I went through it four times. Uh, anyway, it's, it's 18 years, and I feel great. Yeah. And you look, you look fantastic. It's almost like, it just feels like you, like you've never even had it. So it's, it's kind of like this whole cluster of experience that you've had to, that you learned through all of this is really being able to sit with people that, that are um, facing death and that are, that are uh, um, choosing what, whether they want to stay here or whether they're going to go or whether they're going to grow through cancer. 
Um, you're, you know, helping so many people because I know that you want to uh, share about that people should not be afraid to contact the spiritual counselor, right? Yeah, if you're facing cancer and you're in the hospital, don't be shy about contacting a chaplain. It does not mean you're giving up. And you don't need to be religious in order for them to be helpful. Chaplains are experts in helping you process all of the material, all of the anxiety, all of the things about hope and fear and distress, and they help you connect to your deep inner wisdom. So uh, if you don't have, um, if you aren't a member of a local parish or whatever, you can still, through many hospitals, can't ask for spiritual care. They work there, they're trained in this, and they come and they, they sit with you. Often when we have cancer, we spend a lot of energy protecting our loved ones from any conversations about mortality or suffering, and we are strong for them. But we may, in the back of our mind, be thinking about death and dying, and am I going to get through this? Guess what? Your family's thinking about the same thing. Right. But it may not be, you may not feel safe. You want to protect each other from that. So talk to a chaplain. They can be safe to talk to. They, they help you process all of that. And they're going to help you with a roadmap. So you know what to expect, not only spiritually, but um, physically, uh, they can help. They can give you a tour of a radiation unit, up to the cancer unit, um, help you around the hospital, help with practical things, connect you with your social worker and uh, nurse educator. We're part of your healthcare team. And um, I think we do a great job. That's wonderful. I, it's just like you would be absolutely the person I would want to come to because I would feel like, yeah, it, you, you have that that presence already that that makes somebody feel safe. Well, right? Cornelia, I hope you never need me. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm not going that direction. I canceled my appointment with cancer uh, a there while back. Uh, yes. that, that, you know, I yeah. definitely had, was looking at some things there and I, I said, nope, that's not the direction that I'm going to go. And then I started my holistic practice. Yes, you more did. So, which, which is what you talk about too, because you talk a lot about meditation and you talk about yeah. um, other holistic practices that health and diet and, and different things. And so light work, right? Really holding your yes. high level consciousness. Um, and, uh, and, and access things like, um, therapeutic touch or Reiki or these energy treatments, because now there's scientific validation of the energy field around you and how it can reflect in and affect the physical. So, so do that. Also want to mention chaplains will respect your spiritual beliefs. So whatever rituals you need, they will provide for you or bring in someone who can. Um, they are not there to convert you. Um, in fact, for professional chaplaincy, that's unethical. Uh, we are there to honor your spiritual beliefs or lack of and help you connect to that deep inner wisdom. It's about so much more than religion. It's about the love story because mm -hmm. God is love. So we'll help you focus on the love and, um, and get you through that. Right. And so what's your days like, you know, spending your days at work? Like that's got to be a, a, a challenging um, like you said, a tough job because here you are with people that are deeply suffering and they have a lot of grief and they have a lot of pain and they have a lot of trauma. How does well, I will share. How do you do that? Um, first, by taking a break. I've been on sabbatical for a whole year. I have been spending a touring North America, speaking at conferences and taking care of myself, exercising, getting out with friends. You need to recharge the battery and have balance. My days at work, you're swimming in suffering eight hours a day. And it's a profound privilege. You got to keep your keel deep in the water when you're swimming in this because you don't want to capsize. And you're helping the medical team. It's exciting. Uh, there's a lot of adrenaline, but now that's safe for me. Mm -hmm. And um, it's you never walk away from the hospital wondering, you know, what did I do today to make a difference? Every day is infused with deep meaning. And I don't know what's going to happen when I go in to see a patient, but I ask my guides and I'll say, you know, be with me, give me the words, help me be silent when I need to and deeply present and hold the tender, broken humanity with, um, mm -hmm. with love. I am richer for that. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. It's really beautiful. Can you tell us, um, can you tell us a couple of stories from people that, um, that have had profound oh. effects. I mean, 
Yeah, I, I, I sat with Brandon, who was a young man dying. He was unconscious. Uh, osteosarcoma, bone cancer had spread out. His parents, who um, were divorced but good with each other, were on either side of the bed, and he was unconscious. They were uh, wondering, would he live through the night? Because his brother was flying out from Calgary, thousands of miles away, and had promised he would be there for Brandon, uh, and he wouldn't die alone. So we sat and we talked, and I helped them with their grief and how to be deeply present. And the love was amplified because they were no longer suppressing any part of the the nightmare they were able to tenderly hold each other and be at his side then i asked has anything interesting happened has he been speaking because uh, we were talking about what is it like to die and what will he see the most common thing patients see is the spirit of uh, a loved one who's died before your grandmother well what do you know he said gee a couple nights ago brandon was saying his grandmother's name or no it, his sister's name, his sister's name. And now his sister had died before he was born. Hmm. And her name was Vanessa. He never knew her. Wow. But in this last hours of life, he started saying, Vanessa, Vanessa, and as if he was speaking to her from an unconscious state. And then her husband, her ex-husband said, oh, well, last, last night with him, and he was saying, Oma, and his, his grandmother, her great-grandmother's name, they were very close. And I, I nodded my head and I said, right, those are his welcoming committee. He is not alone as he goes through this. In fact, through that love, death is one of the smoothest, safest things you could ever go through. Well, it brought them such profound hope and helped them love with oh, clarity and vulnerability. Now, it doesn't rescue anyone from the situation and it doesn't fix anything but it transforms it because when love shows up like that everything changes the whole family gathered outside and all of the friends and there was a big crowd they got such hope from that and they knew he would be comfortable as he is going through the transformation that's waiting for us all david you gave us so much hope today thank you so much for spreading your love for sharing your story and for doing the good work that you're doing in sharing your gifts with the world. It's been an honor and a pleasure to have you here on the show today. Please, one more time before we go, let's tell everybody where to get your uh, website. So please go to davidmaginley.com. That's david, M-A-G-I-N-L-E-Y.com. You'll see all of my, um, my blog and you can get the book through there. You can also buy my book, Beyond Surviving, Cancer and Your Spiritual Journey from Amazon, or any local bookstore. Please support your local bookseller. I'm on Facebook at D McGinley. You know, you'll see all the links. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening. Much love. See you next time. Namaste.